Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Rick Lufkin, chair of MIT's Cardinal and Gray Society. This is the third in our virtual fall virtual speaker series. We're actively planning a new series of talks starting in February. We hope to announce our speakers and dates soon. Today, I want to extend an especially warm welcome to members of our companion organization, the Emma Rogers Society. Thank you for joining Cardinal and Gray members today and for your enduring support of the Institute. In these extraordinary times, we value human connection perhaps more than ever in the past. The purely virtual platform of today's event required for health and safety causes each of us to stretch our skills and capabilities, and I applaud you for participating. Please be assured that you will have the opportunity to submit questions for our presenter during the talk. Type them into the Q&A box on Zoom whenever they occur to you. We have allowed time on the schedule after the talk, and I will make every attempt to ensure they all get answered. We cannot be physically together today, but are connected for sure. I am honored to introduce to you today Sarah Seeger, who is the class of 1941 Professor of Planetary Science, Professor of Physics, and Professor of Astronautics and Aeronautics at MIT. She is widely recognized as a leader in the study of extrasolar planets and their atmospheres, in particular the ostensibly rare Earth analogs. She has been significantly involved in several NASA projects aiming to extend knowledge in that area. Before joining MIT, Professor Seeger spent four years on the senior research staff at the Carnegie Institution of Washington, preceded by three years at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Her doctorate is from Harvard University and her Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto. Among other accolades, Professor Seeger is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a 2013 MacArthur Fellow. When Sarah was first suggested as a speaker for our series, the information I was given seemed conflicting. Besides his considerable scientific credentials I briefly described just now, she recently published a book which garnered a star review from Publishers Weekly with the descriptor, this wondrous tale of discovery, loss, and love is both expansive and intimate. This surely doesn't sound like a scientific tome. In this memoir, Sarah writes in a deeply personal way about the loss of her husband to cancer and finds parallels between the search for life in other parts of the universe and the effort to live a good life here on Earth. The author bio for The Smallest Lights in the Universe describes her as now at the forefront of the search for the first Earth-like exoplanets and signs of life on them. We are about to have the pleasure in hear of hearing in person from this wonderfully complex and intriguing woman. Please help me welcome now, Professor Sarah Seeger. Sarah? Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Although we can't meet in person, it's wonderful for me to be able to share my story. So here's a picture of my book, and it's called The Smallest Lights in the Universe, which I'll get to um, soon while, why it's called that. I started at MIT as a professor about 10 or 15 years ago. And sometimes I love to describe my job as um, searching for alien life, not little green humanoids, but searching for signs of life on planets far away. My memoir, it's actually about the journey of inner space and also the journey of outer space. And so I'll start with outer space. If I could see all of you, I would ask you, you know, how many of you have seen a truly dark sky? And I hope a lot of you have, but even if not, you can step outside tonight, I think might even be clear before the onset of the big nor'easter we're supposed to get here. But you can look up at the stars and wonder what kind of planet is around that star? because every star in the sky is the sun. And as far as we can tell, all as well, all stars are suns and our sun has planets. We expect the other stars to have planets also, and they do. And astronomers, we have found thousands and thousands of planets. In fact, there are billions of stars in our galaxy alone and billions and billions of galaxies out there. So the possibilities are really huge and, and wondrous. Just to help you understand what an exoplanet is, I'm going to start with a, a, an image of a galaxy that we think our Milky Way might look like from afar. 
And I'm actually going to show you this animation where it starts out with this fake galaxy of what we think our Milky Way looks like. And it zooms in to what is a real map of the sky, real map of the stars. The white stars are points we don't know have planets yet. And the highlighted red, yellow, white ones are stars with known exoplanets. Now you can download the software, it's called Eyes on Exoplanets. And on the top bar, you can click on Earth and go anywhere. Here we'll go to the west coast of North America. And this just happens to be the spring night sky for someone who made, from someone who made the video. But look, if you overlay the constellations, you can see how many stars with planets there actually are. There's a very special patch of the sky. So many stars with planets. It's because of the NASA's Kepler Space Telescope that stared at that one patch for three and a half years, four years. Now, if you know the name of a planet, a star with a planet, you can type that name in and zoom in. The software will zoom in to where that particular star is. And this one, it's showing you a few details, has five planets orbiting it. And one of the planets is in the so-called habitable zone, the zone around the star that's not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. If you click, it goes in further. And here's where you have to look at the fine print at the bottom of the screen. Hypothetical visualization of planet. We don't see any exoplanets in that level of detail. Wow, I had to rush through that so quickly because that, that video is just moving very fast. But to summarize, every star is a sun. We know of thousands of stars out there that have exoplanets. And we actually expect that, that they all do actually and that so many planets are out there just waiting to be found. So just to tell you a bit more about exoplanets, there's so many of them, they're not what we expect. We haven't found any solar system copies yet. Our solar system is both rare and very hard to find. I actually have these, I, I picked out a few um, NASA travel posters that NASA created. And what's really funny is that they're kind of retro and they're intended for us to imagine a possible time in the future where people might travel to other worlds. It's not possible for the foreseeable future or maybe even the indefinite future. But nonetheless, this poster says Kepler 186F, where the grass is always redder on the other side. Kepler 186F is a small red dwarf star, the same one I actually showed in the animation. And the artist is imagining that it's, the planet has a red glow and perhaps the trees have a different pigment making them look red instead of green. Experience the gravity of HG 40307G, a super earth. And here the artist is depicting a planet, a real planet that has a surface gravity about one and a half times that of earth. It would be really hard for us to walk around on that planet because we would just feel compressed. And they're imagining um, going there and parachuting in this higher gravity environment. Kepler 16b, the land of two suns, where your shadow always has company. And Kepler 16b is a circumbinary planet. It's a planet that orbits two stars. We have a couple dozen of, of such planetary systems. With these two stars, I like to say that science fiction got some things right. On Tatooine, two, two suns, two sunsets, two sets of shadows. To help summarize exoplanets for you, I downloaded this little animation. And it's showing us the mass of the planet on the y-axis and the period of the planet, the orbit of the planet in years. And it's showing you the year, 1768, 1770. I'm gonna run through this twice because there, there's a lot of information here. But this y-axis, it's on a logarithmic scale. So it's covering a tremendous range of planet masses. So here we are going through, um, you know, over a century ago. And, you know, the number of planets is changing a little bit. When I cycle through it the next time, I'll, I'll explain why. But it's pretty much a stationary picture. There are planets in our solar system. Pluto just popped up. Nine planets. Here's the count in orange. And something interesting starts to happen in the mid-1990s. Um, planets around sun-like stars start to be discovered, but they're all quite massive. They're at the high end of the diagram because these massive planets are easier to detect than lower mass planets. But look how rapidly exoplanets start to be uncovered. And this field is moving very quickly. 
we're now at 2005, only 15 years ago. And this, uh, this diagram just kind of goes crazy on us. Now we're seeing different techniques by the different colors. And yeah, it's pretty, pretty crazy. We know thousands of planets. This diagram probably only shows a small number of them. You can see we're pushing down to smaller and smaller planets, even some less massive than Earth. And so there's just a wealth of planets out there. Now I wanted you to look here again. So here's back in the 1700s, we had Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. It was not immediate until uh, Uranus and Neptune were discovered. Oh, there's one, Uranus, look for Neptune. Now watch, bottom, bottom. See the bottom there between one and 10? What's that? It's an asteroid called Ceres, which people took to be a planet. Oh, now it's gone. Ceres got demoted. We found the asteroid belt soon after and decided Ceres wasn't worthy of planet status. Now I just wanted you to see this one more time because in 1930, we'll see, oh, there's Pluto in the far bottom right of the diagram. And Pluto, as you know, um, it's no longer officially considered a planet, unfortunately, because around Pluto, we discovered the Kuiper belt, a giant belt of leftover icy bodies. Okay, so you've seen this part and it'll, it'll just go on. I wanna just say, share how exciting it is to be part of this field of exoplanets. I started working on it in 1996 and just to watch the field grow and flourish has been really amazing. So I just have a couple more things on exoplanets before I get to my memoir. And my memoir does go through my journey working in the field of exoplanets and being part of some of these really big discoveries. But I just wanted to leave you, I wanted to make sure I included a few scientific points here, but it's the main way that we find planets today. It's called transiting planets. And if you look at the artist's conception on the top, you can see a little dot here. This is a fake image of a planet going in front of the star for planet star systems that are fortuitously aligned. And what we measure instead is what you see in the bottom here. It's the brightness of a star as a function of time. In a crude sort of way, it would be like taking your phone and you know, taking an image of the sky every minute <laughs> and then doing that for days, months, even years on end. And then using a computer to measure the brightness of the stars in the field and look for a tiny drop in brightness. And this is now standard operating procedure. We can find planets very easily with this method. In fact, here at MIT, we have a big NASA mission called TESS named after, it's called, it's the girl's name TESS, but it's actually Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And this is TESS a few years ago when it was still being assembled. TESS is now in outer space. It's in a very highly elliptical, highly inclined orbit about Earth. TESS looks at, honestly, nearly a million stars every month. And computers here at MIT and computers at NASA Ames chug through that data looking for the tiny drops in brightness. If you'd like to know more about TESS and where we're at now, feel free to ask a question and we'll get to that after my talk. But TESS finds on order of 100 new planet candidates every month. Imagine being part of a mission where we're finding 100 new possibilities, possible other worlds every month. Now, I just have a sidebar story I wanted to share with you about MIT. Because one of the things that I love about MIT is no one ever says no to, to a good or to a crazy idea. And that's what I love most about, most about MIT. When I first arrived at MIT, I had my own idea for a telescope that could find transiting planets. And that is to find transiting planets around the very, very brightest sun-like stars. One that is like Earth that would take a year to go around its star. But if you look at this image on the whole, the brightest stars are spread all around the sky. So you wouldn't be able to have a single telescope looking at all the stars at one time. My dream back when I arrived at MIT about 15 years ago was to have a constellation. Lots and lots of telescopes, miniature ones, all looking at one star at a time. And by the way, I mentioned this idea to a colleague when I first arrived at MIT and I asked if I could incubate the project in the class, a class, and he said, yes. So we actually were able to 
start a few years later in this class. It's a wonderful class. It's a design and build class called 16.83. It's kind of evolved over the years, but there's me in the back here and there's um, the students at the time. Some of them are undergrads, some of them are graduate mentors. We had a bigger class initially and there's the little satellite. Now, the problem with this idea is called precision pointing. This is showing you um, pointing stability on the y-axis. Don't worry about the units. And the x-axis is mass in kilograms. And all the squares and triangles are different telescopes that have been in space. A lot of them you won't be familiar with, but if you look here, you can see HST, that's Hubble. And just this is, you don't have to understand this slide to understand the rest of the talk, but I wanted to give you something technical to chew on. And that is that these, to get the brightness of a star really precisely, you have to keep your telescope pointed incredibly well. But a little telescope, there's a lot of ways to kind of, for it to not be stable. The reaction wheels that position it will cause vibration, just external forces. And so to get our telescope here circled in green, we literally had to do 10 or 100 times better than anything in its mass category. So what's so great about MIT, when I came to MIT and said, I want to do something 10 or 100 times better than has been done before. You know, if you say that outside MIT, people laugh and they do, they did laugh at me. But at MIT, it's like, sure, we can do, we can incubate this in the class. So I'll come back to this in a moment. So I did arrive at MIT in around 2007 and I really did have the perfect life looking back. You know, I had my dream job. I had what I thought was my dream house. It's where I am now. It's in Concord, Massachusetts in a beautiful, old, charming Victorian, which is actually only charming until you actually live in it <laughs> because it's not very practical. You know, I had two adorable toddlers, a wonderful husband. Everything was going so well until my husband, Mike, had a stomach ache that rapidly worsened. It was here like day on, day off. The doctor just completely blew it off. Now it's not a good time here for us on earth. You know, the coronavirus is really bad. Hospitals are full, but I still wanna urge all of you, you know, if you have like a problem and the doctor says, I'm sure that half of you at least have been there. And the doctor says, no, it's nothing. That's kind of what they do typically. Uh, -uh. If you think it's something, it turns out it's all within our own power, you know, to research, to push the doctors, to demand tests and really go for it. We weren't really there and I wasn't, they do say, they do say, um, I don't know if it's true, but men live longer when they're, if their wives nag them. I was not a nag. I should, should maybe have been, but the doctors wouldn't do tests. They just kind of said, let's, let's wait. So we waited until Mike got really sick. He couldn't get out of bed. He had a complete intestinal blockage and he uh, had to go to the hospital. You know, they had just originally said he didn't have a problem, he's just constipated, just, you know, don't worry too much. But we later looked back and we saw a lot of other signs that we had missed. So I was just, you know, thinking in the hospital with him and I just, at the time was so, so sad. All I knew was my dad, he had a bad stomach ache that he didn't know what it was that rapidly worsened and he had died. So I was just crying. I can laugh about it now, but the doctor just started yelling at me. He's like, Sarah, stop crying. He's like, this could be nothing. Like how can a complete intestinal blockage in a 45 year old, very healthy man be nothing? He's like, it could be nothing. You know, if it is, we'll just, we'll, we're gonna cut it out. It's like cutting out part of a sausage. If it's cancer, it might be fully self-contained. He might not even need chemo and on and on and on and on. But it just turned out that we had all the bad news. You know, at every turn, it could have been nothing. It could have been like stage one or two cancer. But when they do the surgery, they cut out like a big chunk of your intestines. You don't need it anyway, it's a repeating pattern, but they cut out enough so that they can get to the lymph nodes so they can see if the cancer has spread. And it, it did, it had spread. And he was so strong, they likened him to the Marines and war vets because he would just take anything. He rode his bicycle to chemo. He was a trooper. But one day he, I'm trying not to be angry at the doctors because maybe it's, maybe it's the way they're trained. Like, I don't know, maybe it's their mentality. You know, they didn't decide to become scientists or engineers, but they, um, one day Mike came home and he just told me, 
you know, by this time he was terminal, by the way, so we knew he was going to die. It was only a matter of like how and when. And the doctor, he came home and said, Sarah, the doctor told me that I shouldn't die at home because we have young children. And I was livid. I was so angry. I just said, Mike, what, what kind of lesson will that teach our children? Like it's not now looking back in coronavirus, it's a totally different situation. But back then we're still allowed to be with people. We're, we're allowed to hug people. I'm like, what lesson would that teach our children? And so I just, you know, that we just, we're gonna drop you off at the hospital like to die without us. I said, no, we will love you and take care of you until the day you die. So unfortunately he did, you could see where the story is going, I, I guess so he did, he did die and grief is just so terrible. I know some of you have gone through it. My friends and the people I've met before from the Emma Rogers Society, I know you know, you don't need me to explain it. I'm, I'm not gonna explain it. I'll just say that, um, you know, grief just is bad. It's terrible, it's, it's awful. And one of the things that was bad for me was that because he, I was so ambitious in my job and he had given up his career. He worked part-time. He had essentially given up his career to support me working at MIT. Like when we moved back to the area, he got offered his old job back in the city and he, he just didn't want to be going to the city and wearing a tie and not getting time off. So um, I had never understood the plight of the working mom because I had a lot of help. So all of a sudden here I was widowed and single and I didn't have any family nearby. And I was just like, I didn't know how to do like the simplest things. I know how to do them all now, but I just couldn't even, um, I didn't know how in my house that my furnace was gonna go, the central vac, where does that go? I just didn't have all this together. And he was so sweet. He had left me this three page list of like who to call if this goes wrong, who to call if that goes wrong, where the kids should go to school when they finish their Montessori that they were at. I called that my guide to life on earth. Yeah, so anyway, when I you know, think about the stars, it definitely helped give me a sense of perspective because the universe is just so vast. And I love to imagine that there's an intelligent alien civilization on a planet orbiting a nearby star with the kind of telescopes we're still planning to build. And to them, you know, our own earth, it's just a pinprick of light. It's just a pale blue dot. And that definitely puts things into perspective. Here's a real image of our earth um, as seen from the Voyager 1 spacecraft when it was 4 billion miles away. And what you can see here is this, this dot, this dot in the center, that's earth. And so yes, to the rest of the universe, earth is just an exoplanet. And that red light, by the way, it's scattered light in the camera optics. But our own earth would still have a, a band of red light surrounding it. Our asteroids collide together and they generate dust that reflects light and looks in the red. So Mike's death had a, it had like a catastrophic shift for me because all of a sudden everything seemed meaningless. Like the stuff people do on a daily basis. I don't want to get like overly heavy here because I know this is like an afternoon talk, but it's, it's just like things seem meaningless. You know, I'd heard my friends at my book club, they were arguing about who will pick the kids up from school, who will do, it's like, okay, just fighting about stuff, just ant noise. The way the ants are just appear to be purpose, purposelessly moving around, they do have purpose, but I, I couldn't see it. And so to deal with my new sense of meaninglessness, I decided I would pursue the search for another earth and for signs of life on it in as dedicated a way as I could. Anyway, that's a kind of a flavor of my memoir. I still have more to my talk, but kind of like, it's about the search for meaning, the exploration of outer space, of inner space. And it kind of just tries to weave my story together in a way that um, hopefully is, is meaningful for you. So we can find planets, but we're not able to tell if there's another Earth yet. We're mostly looking at big planets, massive planets. Um, we're trying to work harder and we have new telescopes coming online that will help us study smaller and smaller exoplanets. So I like to say that sometimes science fiction got some things wrong. I'm sure there are a few Star Trek fans out there. But if you remember, the Star Trek Enterprise had to travel at incredible speeds and vast distances to orbit another world so that Spock could get his life analyzer 
and look down at the planet surface and see what's there. Like if you tried to make a movie today of um, an astronomer who like mine or another person in the field's life, it would be incredibly boring. We don't have to go anywhere. We don't go anywhere. We use the Hubble Space Telescope and others. And we use those to study atmospheres of planets far away. We're mostly confined to studying um, big planets with hot atmospheres, way too hot for any kind of life as we know it. Um, and so we're working on the next generation telescopes. There's one launching at the end of 2021 called the James Webb Space Telescopes. The proposals for it were due for general users. There were 1,200 proposals, not all for exoplanets. But we have to wait a while longer before we can really get to atmospheres around planets. But I just briefly wanted to describe to you how we're going to study atmospheres in a very kind of qualitative way. You've all seen a rainbow. But did you know if you could look at the rainbow up close that you would see that some parts of the rainbow are missing? And here's another picture of a rainbow. But instead of between, instead of, um, instead of a raindrop breaking up the starlight, here you can see it's a special instrument called a spectrograph breaking up the starlight. And you see all these little pieces of colors missing. Each one of these, or a set of each of these, corresponds to a molecule or atom absorbing light, either in our own Earth's atmosphere or in the sun's photosphere. And this is how we study exoplanets too. We actually look at their atmospheres and we look for absorption features that through quantum mechanics, we can match up with specific individual molecules. And for exoplanets, we have studied about 100 different exoplanet atmospheres, but we're looking forward in the future to finding small rocky planets and being able to there study their atmospheres to understand whether a planet may be like Earth with oceans and water vapor in the atmosphere, and perhaps even signs of life by way of gases that don't belong. So um, I have a couple more technical things if, if you want to ask during the Q&A. But um, back to my story that's in my memoir, um, I haven't found another Earth yet, but instead I found a couple of other amazing things that were, were unexpected. What happened was I was in my town of Concord and we had a snow, we had snow, we had snow, you know, we used, it feels like our winters used to be more snowy. But one day I was, um, it was in the morning on a Saturday and I just remember I had a huge headache I woke up and my kids were excited because there was snow on the ground and they wanted to go sledding. It's pretty flat overall in Massachusetts, but we have this one hill in town. We have a couple of hills, but one of them it's called Neshotic Hill. So I decided to take them sledding at this hill, but it was, um, I got to the hill and there wasn't quite enough snow. So the kids were sledding down, but one of them just kept getting stuck. He got stuck where there were these tall grasses poking through and he just uh, started melting down. He doesn't like it when I tell this story, but he was starting to melt down. You know, part of grief and depression is you just don't have any emotional reserves. It's like I say, you know, no money in the bank, like that. So the littlest things can set you off. And so I just started, there are these only one, two other people there, two kids and two moms. And these moms were just so perfect looking. All I could think of was like, it's just, life is just unfair sometimes. There are these happy, perfect families. And here I am just like struggling to get through my day and my kids like melting down and it's just not what I need on a weekend. So I started my own little meltdown and fast forward, I have no idea why, but I just blurted out, my husband died because these widow, these other ladies were like, can you move your kid? You gotta move him. And I was just like, no. And I just started, I just dumped all my anger in this like meltdown in public, which is incredibly embarrassing. And the most shocking thing happened. One of the women who was there, her name's Melissa, she walked up to me and just said, my husband died too. And if any of you remember my talk from a few years ago at the Emma Rogers Society, you'll remember Melissa who came with me and she's right here. And the most bizarre thing ever is that in my small town of Concord, there's about 20,000 people. And she had told me she had just started a widow's group of young women widows who were in their late thirties or early forties. And I started attending this group and it was pretty crazy. It was funny, um, the widows are just so funny because they have to be, you have to kind of have this, you've got to get through the day. And Melissa there um, 
I had to blank their faces out here, but we got together on what we call the important holidays, like Father's Day and Valentine's Day and Halloween. And I know some of you think this is really sad, but it was definitely, when I look back, very, very, very happy. We started meeting every other Friday morning for coffee. Our first topic was always how to stay afloat financially. You know, I was the only widow working, but even to work, you know, took money. Like I had to earn a huge amount of money, pay tax, and then pay all my household help. You know, I had a housekeeper who came every day. I had babysitters who became extended family, but lots of help. And it just, I burned through my savings. So Melissa ended up becoming a very, she's still my best friend. You know, I still see her. And here she is with me, and there's a model of the TESS Space Telescope. You can see Melissa's always smiling and happy. I started taking her to work events as my plus one because she loves talking to people. Um, we, I took her to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Some of you will be envious, but we toured this. Um, it's in California. We toured the lab. You can see here there's the Mars rover, one of the Mars rovers being tested. And what they do is if the Mars rover fails or if it has a problem, they have one here on Earth that they can, can work through to, to uh, problem solve and debug. Here we are pretending to operate the Mars rover in the, in the control room. And yes, yeah, so things did start to get better after meeting the widows and after slowly, gradually he healing. My little satellite I told you about, um, it went to Jet Propulsion Lab where a number of the PhD students who had worked on it and other people who had been in the class, they actually had moved to JPL. They'd finished at MIT, moved to JPL, took a job there. And they were able to continue working on the project, which I had to give to JPL because we had done the problem solving part here at MIT, but we needed a more experienced group to implement. It grew in size, it changed a bit, but here it is in the spring of 2018 where it's uh, finally being um, put together and finished off. It's a little tiny telescope. And this is a prototype of what hopefully one day will be a constellation full of similar objects. And in, oh, that was wrong. That one was supposed to be 2017, my apologies. And in August, 2017, the little telescope got launched as cargo to the International Space Station on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. And here's it being deployed a couple months after. See it, that's the telescope that little black blob, it looks like a cereal box. It's being spit out by this special deployer. You can see Earth below rotating and you can see the solar panels on the International Space Station. I'm proud to say that this little tiny telescope, um, it, it stayed in orbit for two years and it incredibly successfully demonstrated the technology to point precisely that 10 or 100 times better than anything in its mass category. And that's a direct product of the, the spirit of MIT. So um, back to the stars and the wonder of the universe. The funniest thing about Melissa is that as a, like a layperson who never studied science, she started attending, as I said, all the work events. I took her to see JPL. And for the widows too, you know, after how to stay afloat financially, our next topic was dating and how to, how to meet people, which is really hard when you're older and when you're a widow with all that baggage. And Melissa did most of the dating, but she actually said something so funny one day. Melissa said that, you know, finding another Earth is so hard. We haven't found one yet. And I forgot to mention earlier that our Earth is so small and so faint and so less massive compared to a sun-like star. You know, our Earth is 10 billion times fainter than our sun. And those Earths out there, they are the smallest lights in the universe. And so Melissa started saying, you know, Sarah, I understand how hard it is to find another earth. But after being widowed and all that dating, Melissa said, it's harder to find true love than it is to find another earth. So I know I'm gonna find another earth um, because I actually, I, it's in the book, but you'll have to read it. But I, I met my new husband, Charles at a conference, an amateur astronomy conference. We became friends and had a, fantastic romance and we, we got married a few years ago and Charles adopted my boys. So here I am today. I'm still working on exoplanets. I'm also working on Venus. I have a lot of projects going on. My favorite projects remain the ones um, working towards finding another Earth. That's a summary of my book and, and my life and where I'm at now.
And I just want to thank you all for, for coming to my talk and for asking questions, which we now have time for. Thank you so much. Sarah, thank you. At one level, I want to say, you know, Professor Seeger to keep it formal and professional, but when the, the human dimensions of your story are so moving that I sort of want to reach out and pardon me, give you a hug and, and say, Sarah, thank you for the, the dimensions of that story. It was absolutely striking from so many, so many different perspectives. Um, the, the one thing that you're trying to move into the you know, get off the get off the emotional roller coaster and work on the the issues at, at hand that uh, keep keep it on a, on a business basis. Um, when I see all those planets, my first question is: Is somebody working on the science fiction concept of wormholes so we can visit some of those places? <laughs> yes. Well, we're not working on wormholes now, unfortunately, because <laughs> as you know, the wormholes would be they have such strong gravity. They would totally destroy us if we could get near one, if we even knew of one nearby. So we're not doing that, but we do have some other projects, not for us humans to go to a nearby star, but people are trying to think about how could we send anything to the nearest star. Thank you. I also would ask, what is your favorite exoplanet? Well, you know, my normal answer to that question is the next planet, because there's so many planets that there's always a better planet out there. But just to be brief, my favorite one, it has a catalog name called K218b. And it actually is a really interesting planet. It's in between the size of Earth and Neptune. So it's a bit more than two times the size of Earth, mm -hmm. but it's a very mysterious planet. We have thousands of planets like that, that we don't know what they're made of. We don't know what they are. But this particular one, um, it may actually have a liquid water ocean, despite being more like a Neptune than an Earth. Okay. Um Let's go. Some of the, our, our audience have asked questions, so I'm going to get a, a handle on that. Uh, Charles asks, "How many planets are there likely to be in the ex, in the galaxy?" Thought experiment. It would seem that our galactic na galactic neighbors would be unable to detect our solar system. We only experience about two transits of Venus in about 200 years, and we are very close to the same orbital orbital plane. Okay, so there are a lot of different ways to find planets. Transits are not the only one. And as Charles points out correctly, that um, for ours, if a system's looking back, if there's an intelligent civilization looking at our planetary system for transits, I think what he's saying is that if we see Earth transit, they see Earth transit, they won't see Venus transit. All of that's correct. But there's other ways to find them as well. And we have evidence that nearly every star has planets, more than one. So if there's hundreds of billions of stars, there's easily over a trillion planets. And I just want to say, because I'm not sure if this was in the question, but we do see some systems with five transiting planets, six mm -hmm. transiting planets. So those kind of planar systems do exist as well. Paul Eckstein asks, could you discuss angular momentum in the universe? It seems to be pervasive to all bodies. Is it seen throughout the universe? Well, every, I don't have a lot to say on that, except to agree that everything we see seems to be rotating one way or another. OK. Uh, Greg Fister. What makes a telescope good at transit detection? Well, it has to have a detector that is able to detect tiny changes in brightness. That's the number one. Number two is the telescope has to be able to point very, very precisely. It's like if you take a picture and your hands are shaking, it gets blurry. And the technical reason is that if you could take the detector and shine a laser and measure how much comes back at you, you'd see that across a single pixel the amount that responds is diff is varies by 40%. Hmm. You have to keep the center, the centroid of the star in the same fraction of a pixel at all time. Otherwise you can't make a brightness measurement. And finally, these det detectors are typically very sensitive to temperature. And so you have to control hmm. the detector. So to summarize, you need a sensitive detector, one that can be controlled with temperature and you need to be able to point the telescope precisely because of defects in the detector. Uh, Jerome, and L Jerome Lerman asks, how do you determine the mass and size of exoplanets? That takes a little longer to explain, so I'll just answer the size one. <laughs> but okay. when the planet goes in front of the star, the starlight drops in brightness. And that's related to the planet to star area ratio. Okay. Yeah, so if you know the size, if you know the area of the star and you measure the area ratio, you can get the area or the size of the planet. Uh, Alan Mitchell asks, what does 
Dr. Seeger taught, teach or research in the Department of Aero and Astro? Well, in the past, I helped teach the design and build class, the same one where my project mm -hmm. was incubated. I've taught that one a few times. And I also um, supervise students and postdocs in that class. So my student and postdoc right now from AeroAstro are helping work on the constellation that the prototype I showed you the image of. Um, yeah, it's the constellation. Okay. Alan Mitchell, at Mitchell asks, if intelligent life exists among the exoplanets and the speed of light is an absolute maximum, how could we physically meet aliens here or there? That I so that just watch science fiction because you know, <laughs> you gotta go through the wormhole, go to sleep for <laughs> many centuries. There's no way that we know how to do it right now. Rick Gander asks, what is the exo in exoplanets? Well, the exo, think of it like exoskeleton. That might not be the best analogy, but exo means planets outside of our solar system. Okay. David Tweed asks, transit seem is easy. Are there other techniques to find planets? Yeah, I mean, transit seem easy, but they're still not really because we have to measure a tiny drop in brightness. For a Jupiter-sized planet around a sun-sized star, it's a part in 100, which isn't that hard. Hmm. But think about a smaller planet like Earth around a sun, that would be more like one part in 10,000. Yeah. It's just that we've spent a long time, you know, making detectors better and knowing how to go to space, it seems easy. There are definitely a lot of, you know, it takes me um, an entire semester to explain all of this in a class. Yeah, I understand. So I think I'll just leave that one for now and let you research that on your own. Paul Eckstein asks, could you discuss how the small, stat small satellites are stabilized? Yes. First of all, the small satellite has a traditional reaction wheel unit, but small reaction wheels that perform fairly well. And these reaction wheels, um, they point the telescope somewhat, but it's still not pointed as stably as it needs. We did something brand new where uh, I want to say it's like image stabling binoculars, where the focal plane, the detector is mm. attached to the focal plane, and we have a special XY stage that moves, moves around. So as the centroid of the stars drift, the detectors move back and forth to compensate. So perhaps thinking of the whole thing being pointed is wrong. It's pointing okay, and then we're just correcting it in real time on order of like 10 hertz. Vic Bermudez, in searching for life on other planets, are we assuming that the alien biology is similar to ours? If instead it's radically different, how does that affect the search for extraterrestrial terrestrial life? Yes, well, unfortunately, we're not clever enough to think of an entire alien biochemistry. <laughs> So we just kind of ignore that problem, especially being astronomers. We are looking for life's, what life does, metabolic by, metabolism, and we're looking for byproduct gases. So we're trying to look for gases that don't belong, that like oxygen and earth are in big quantities and shouldn't be. And that's kind of the best we can do. No. Uh, anonymously, we are asked, even though there are, a great no there are a vast number of planets in the universe that appear capable of supporting life, there are so many scientific constraints for life to exist. What is your view on this conundrum? Well, the view is that we, we want to make observations and see what's there. I think we can leave that conundrum for the next generation. So if we hear, if we don't see signs of life in an atmosphere for the number of planets we can look at, which admittedly is not that high, We'll leave that conundrum for the, the next, if we don't find anything, then we'll, we'll start worrying. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Lufkin. Oh, Ruth Lufkin. Hi, Ruth. Uh, having handed the satellite over to JPL, do you have continuing involvement? So that's a good question because I started here and it was my project, my baby, sort of like giving your, you know, your baby up for adoption. But we took the project as far as we could go and we worked together with Draper Lab who helped us solve the hardest technology problem. But then we had no money. You know, JPL wanted the project and I kind of did have to give it away and give up control, but it also meant the project could become real. So JPL was very generous and they called me advisory PI. And so I still PI principal investigator. So they still let me kind of have this status, but I was not unfortunately um, able to be involved like on the day-to-day, -day, you know, the day-to-day -day basically. But I was still available to one of my postdocs, who was a former student, got to help operate it, and I was still out there for out at JPL for key events. So I was involved, but not nearly like I would have been if the, I was able to have kept the project. Yeah. Uh, Phil Lynch asks, what about the recent detection of phosphine on v Venus? Yeah, that's a whole other story. And given that I only had 35 minutes and I wanted to share my <laughs> memoir and the story with you, I had to leave that out entirely. 
So phosphine on Venus is a bit of a roller coaster in and of itself. Yeah. Um, I was part of a team that discovered phosphine on Venus, which could be like a sign of life on another world, although it could be unknown chemistry as well. And I'm going to have to make a, a very long story very short. But it turned out that um, the big observatories like Hubble and like the MIT test mission, NASA test mission, those um, observatories calibrate the data for you. They actually do some corrections, some very basic corrections to the data before the user, the astronomy community uses it. Because there's a lot of quirks in instrumentation. And especially for Venus, it's bright. It's big on the sky. It's not easy to observe with our, our best observatories, which makes, it sounds very ironic, you know, but something can be too bright. Anyway, mm -hmm. so after we published, the observatory itself went back and carefully reviewed every single thing they've done. And they found a bug in the way that they calibrate the data, which mm -hmm. meant all the programs that looked at solar system objects that are spatially resolved had to go back and redo their work, Boston being the highest profile. So this is not what you want to, where you want to be at in a project like this. So we reanalyze the data and we still see phosphine, although the, the feature is, is a lot weaker than we would like. It was kind of an ongoing thing there. But in terms of life, like we really don't know. And just um, not, yeah, we don't know if life is making phosphine. We don't know if it's some unusual chemistry we haven't been able to figure out yet. Yeah. Uh, Phil Lynch observes, um, Again, looking to the human dimension of your story, moved me nearly to tears, which is very rare. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> More of a comment. Um, Ed B asks, are most of the exoplanets found in the Milky Way galaxy? Yes. And in fact, most of the planets are found very close to our own Earth. We can really barely scratch the surface here. There is a report of one planet being found in another galaxy, but that's it. Uh, it's one more than I would have thought. <laughs> okay. um, I guess another question on ph phosphine, but I think we've we've touched on that. It is uh, certainly a current current subject. Um, M. Joe asks, please repeat the web address of the star application you mentioned at the start of the talk. It would be nice to have a link. It's called Eyes on Exoplanets. And eyes, eyes on Exoplanets. Right. And I'm going to cut and paste this into the um, chat, oh, and then thanks. later on you can um, take a look at it yourself. Uh, William Thomas asks, how do you find the planet the size of Earth? I saw a few same or smaller mass objects in your chart of discoveries. Well, each technique has its own way to try to find a planet the size of Earth. The Kepler Space Telescope um, did have very high precision and was able to find some planets the size of Earth by the tran transit method. Oh. However, it didn't find any Earth-sized planets in Earth-like orbits. So any of the ones Kepler did find are too close to the star, too hot for life. But he, again, it would take me many months to explain all this, but each technique is trying to push down te in technology to be able to find smaller and smaller planets. Um, I note that there, no, there is the Drake equation and the Seeger equation. I was wondering if you could compare and contrast the, the two of them for, for finding life on, uh, out there. Well, both of those equations are there to illustrate the elements that go into the search for life. And they're not meant to be predictive or something you derive, like, you know, from 801 or anything. But it turns out that I actually asked Frank Drake if he minded if I took his equation, you know, because he's the one who came up with the idea. But the Frank Drake equation is to, is to sort of estimate how many civilizations might be out there with radio capability who are sending us radio signals. Oh, okay. And you can't actually answer that because some of the terms can never be measured. You supply the user value, like what you think is the best guess. And so I took that equation and I said, what are the chances or how many planets are out there that might show signs of life by way of gases that don't belong? And again, the first few terms in my equation, just like the Drake equation, you can measure and put a number to, but some of the later terms, like how many, what fraction of planets have life what fraction of that life gives off a gas that we can detect? You know, you get to things you want. So there's no real answer in the equation. It's just a sort of tool for you to right. use. Tom Micas asks, how does the calculation for probability of like of life look now? But I think you've addressed that. <laughs> it's unclear. Unclear, unclear. <laughs> uh, Mary Rose McGowan, Sarah, I loved your book. Your description of loss was a great gift. 
uh, for those of us who can't find the words. When will your memoir be made into a movie? How did the memoir came back, came, come about? Um, okay, yeah, the memoir was very circuitous, but when I first became a widow and met my widow friends, it was such a crazy life. Like I really thought that, or just having, I don't know, it was just a bizarre world. And I actually asked the widows, like, why didn't you write a book on this? And they said, no, but they didn't want to because many times widow loses everything, like might not have had a job, loses income, has to split up the family. It's wow, really. And we were just well off and I was still working. The other widows were smarter than me and had a lot of life insurance on their spouses. So we were doing really well and they didn't know how to create a story that could share what it's like to be a young widow without you know, making themselves or others feel bad. But ultimately what happened was someone, I am in, I do represent exoplanets a lot in the news and I often speak on exoplanets or I get asked to quote on other people's works. And eventually someone wrote a profile of me in the New York Times. So if you don't wanna read the book, you can read the short form, which is this um, kind of awkward, kind of personal, work personal New York Times article. It came out, I wanna say 2014, 2015. So just in case someone wanted to know how the industry worked, which you might not want to, but they're the book agents who are constantly trolling like all news available, I learned. And they troll these New York Times profiles. And then apparently like a lot of them, like 15, 20 of the book agents wrote to me are like, oh, do you, uh, this should be a book, this could be a book. But different people had different ideas. Like I think mostly they wanted to see that New York Times feature like expanded basically. And that's how it happened more or less. Got an agent, got a writer, got a book. It's fascinating to get an insight as to how where books really come from sometimes. Thank you for that perspective. Uh, Carl S., are you knowledgeable about the programs to listen from sig for signals from aliens in outer space, presumably referring to the SETI project? Yes, mm -hmm. SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. I'm not up on every last thing they do, but SETI has seen a, seen a big resurgence lately with a, a lot of private money funneled into get the search going again. How will that work given the loss of the telescope in, in Puerto Rico, which I think was the principal uh, data collector for SETI? Well, it may have been the one that got the most attention, but it's not the principal one. Oh, There's okay. one in Australia called the Parks Observatory, and there are a few others around the world. And so the new money went into buying time on some of these telescopes and improving some of the hardware. Okay. Uh, Don Jansen asks, how long do you think it will take to, to, to find a very Earth-like planet? It's going to be a while, unfortunately. I mean, I didn't have time to get into it in my talk, but right now we don't have a way to find a true Earth twin at the moment. And all of our focus is on really small stars, small red dwarf stars that are nothing like our own sun. Yeah. And the planets are also not like ours. So we could find like an Earth cousin type of planet uh, soon, you know, within the next five to 10 years. We have some that might be. We just need to get a look at their atmospheres. There was a story just last week about how when someone had done an analysis of a, a, a small Earth-like planet surrounding a red star, and they concluded that the uh, solar emanations from the red star would probably have wiped out any life that might have could, that could possibly exist on that planet. So awesome. it is a, a tough balance there. Uh, Stan asks, does Mars have life possibilities? We all love to think that life is everywhere, <laughs> and people still hold out that there could be life beneath the surface of Mars in pockets of water. So we'll see. Yeah. Samuel asks, when you examine exoplanet spectra, how do you avoid the trap of looking for patterns that support life's, life's signatures of life as we know it? How do you account for life forms totally foreign to life as we know it? Well, just to emphasize again that right now we can't study atmospheres of small planets with signs of life because our technology is not good enough yet. We just can study giant hot planets with puffy atmospheres that cannot support life. But your point is well taken. And we do spend a lot of time um, in our models, in our simulations, worrying about that. Uh, Anne Street points out, Sarah, thank you for making your personal story public. I lost my, my husband to cancer in May 2020, and he have offered me hope that there is a future after the grief. I look forward to reading your memoir. Thank you, Anne. I, our hearts go out to you. Uh, Wilbur Sulis, um, Pierre Lecomte de Noy calculated the probability that a 2000 atom protein could be f randomly formed as one part in 10. I'm not sure just what the point there is. Does that make any sense to you? I'm sorry. No, but maybe just that it inspires hope that 
you know, life can form, complex molecules can form and things like that. Mike Duffy, can you explain the, the range of the Goldilocks location from min to max to support life as we know it? You know, people work on that. The simplest answer, which you probably haven't heard, is we go from like Venus to Mars and then scale that depending on the star type to be overly generous. But typically people use models of atmospheres, which just like it's so hard to predict weather, it's kind of sometimes the same set of equations. So I would take it with a grain of salt. Um, but essentially the outer edge of the habitable zone, the distance from the star is where the planets, where water freezes and carbon dioxide freezes. So we couldn't have greenhouse gases and the planet would be too cold. On the inner edge, it's typically where water evaporates. The planet is so hot, they will lose all its water and not be habitable for life. So those are the max and min. Hmm. Uh, Kevin Kinsella asks, in your book, you mentioned visiting the Nobel laureate Jack Stozdak, asking him how many chemicals could be detected to ind indicate life. You nominated methane, oxygen, water vapor, etc. cetera. Stozak, I believe, said over 14,000. Which ones are you looking for now? <laughs> right, right. The story is a bit different than that. Um, we did come up with a list of all molecules that are in gas form at room temperature and pressure. And we came up with a list of 14,000 molecules. It's way too many to consider, but life on Earth itself produces a few thousand molecules in gas form, actually. So we're looking at classes of molecules. We look at, uh, and with some individual ones, that's how we came across phosphine. We looked at a gas called isoprene. We have ammonia and other amines. We're looking at um, lots and lots of different ones. We're running close to our end, end point here, but it's a couple more to throw in. Rich Rosen asks, what is the status of plans to large launch a large multitude of your telescopes? Well, right now we're just working on our, uh, we're working to move it forward. We don't have funding yet for it, but we're working on it. Okay. Uh, anonymous, uh, a few recent popular science articles explain the chance of some kind of life in the universe is high, but to find anything like human intelligence is nearly impossible. What are your thoughts? I like to think if there's intelligent life out there that it's sending us radio signals, but I admit that it's a long shot. Okay. Uh, Kev Kevin Kinsella with, I believe is the last question. What is the status of Starshade? Starshade, which I didn't talk about, one of my favorite projects is on hold at the moment. It still gets money for technology development, mm -hmm. but in astronomy and astrophysics, we have this process called the decadal survey. And every 10 years, astronomers are chosen to get together to represent the community and make a priority rank ordered list of which space missions and ground-based projects should be number one, number two. So all astronomy projects are more or less moving slowly right now until that list comes out, hopefully next spring. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah, just to give you a sense as to the, uh, the amount of interest that this talk has engendered, I still have 28 questions listed here that regretfully we will not be able to, to get to. So uh, I think at this stage, we're going to have to bring this afternoon's endeavor to a, a, a untimely close. I did want to thank you uh, uh, for the organization personally, uh, the story you have told is uh, intellectually inspiring and uh, and heartrendingly human, and that's uh, that's really all of us to to share um, the uh, the sense that uh, uh, a person with your scientific achievements can still uh, soldier on with the incredible dimensions of of life that you have represented. So I just wanted to say, from the point of view of the uh, Cardinal and Gray Society, from the Emma Rogers Society, the MIT alumni. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Very much appreciated. And uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to read about your, uh, uh, your, your successes, both uh, personal and professional. And uh, we're all keeping an eye out for more exoplanets. Thank you very, very much. Bye now. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.